gone in his room and he went in his bed, so I thought, oh, maybe he slept out. I'm sorry, please watch your emergency. And I think I found a dead body. That is, sorry? Dead body. There's a dead body? Yeah. The report was received that there was a lifeless body of a young male that was at the water's edge. I was just praying it wasn't true. I was just thinking, no, this isn't true, like it's someone else. There were a lot of rumours regarding it. Has this individual accidentally come to fall into the water? It looked like he'd been beat up. He had, like, punch marks in his eyes. Has he been in a fight? Has whoever's done this to him hurt him? You don't think that it's going to happen to somebody you know. Everyone was just a bit confused, really, and, like, needed answers as to what had happened to Connor. In the northern suburbs of Hull lies Orchard Park, where popular 17-year-old Connor Lyons grew up with his family. When Connor was born, I was with his mum, Kelly. When they took Connor out of his mum's womb, I actually cut the cord, so I was the first person to ever hold Connor. It's a lovely memory, yeah. Hold it dear. It was like a little designer baby. It was like. I don't know why, because I had a million and one nieces and nephews, but I was just always proud of Connor. It was like, I wanted to show him off. I'd be like, I want to push his pram, I want to do this, I want to... Whatever. It was just just such a cute little baby, just always happy, always full of life. Connor's larger-than-life personality shone through at an early age. He was one of the loudest kids, and all the attention was always on him for all the silly things he was doing, and putting smiles on people's faces and making everyone laugh all the time. He was just funny. He played tricks on people. Whether he meant to or he didn't, whether he was laughing at him or with him, he was just full of life. He was very funny, he was humorous. He used to make me laugh a lot. He was quite clever, really. He was quite sharp, comma. And he also had a caring side to him. He could be cheeky and a typical teenager, I suppose, but he always kept his heart, and that's what I loved about Connor. He would do anything for you. Connor was a loving, caring boy. He'd always care for people. He was so loving. He was just a lovely person to talk to. When I was going through a hard time, he was always there for me and supported me through things when other people didn't really listen to me. He was there to listen to me. A typical teen, Connor started to care about his image. Connor was growing into a handsome kid. He always had the best clothes, the best drink, like, he loved nice things. He loved to look nice, smell nice, you know, look good. He, he liked to took pride in his parents. And he took up a thrilling hobby. He used to really enjoy messing about with motorbikes and doing whatever young boys do. He used to absolutely love, do, love doing that. Yeah, he got a lot of enjoyment out of it. But this newfound interest soon led to disaster. He was involved in a motorbike crash. Sadly, he almost died then. He had internal bleeding from his liver, kidney and spleen. He had a broken arm. He was stuck into hospital and he had a major operation. He was, they said he was lucky to be alive. It was his 16th birthday when he came out of hospital and he was in a lot of pain with his arm and he continued to be in a lot of pain with his arm, yeah. Despite making some progress on his physical recovery, the accident took a toll on Connor's mental health. He'd got anxiety, he was upset. Obviously, he couldn't come out for a long while because of his injuries. He'd break down and cry when he never used to, that one Connor. And I said to him, you need to get help, you know, for the trauma that you've been through. And I think he just chose the route of smoking cannabis. It helped calm him down. It helped ease his pain. Connor and his mum made a fresh start by moving to the Brands Home Housing Estate in Hull. And the teen found himself a new companion. Connor absolutely loved his dog, Callie. 
Connor would be out all the time with his dog, Callie, and he loved her to bits, and he'd never stop talking about her. He'd go everywhere with her, and he enjoyed walking her all the time and just spending time with her, really. I think he got on with her dog a lot more than what he did other people, really. Finally, life seemed on a better track. I think something had clicked in his head, and I think he thought, right, I can have a stay in this little circle, smoking weed and roaming the streets and just getting into trouble or whatever, or I can change now. He was full of talk about the future, what he wanted to do with his life, you know, where he wanted to go. A lot more focused he was than what I'd seen him in a long time, really. Connor wanted to have a good career, he wanted to be a plumber and, like, you know, he wanted to, like, buy a house, do his driving lessons. He wanted to do good in life. For me as a mum, I was really happy that Connor had made a career choice and he's changed his life around. He was ready to grow up and just do all the normal things that you do in life. He was ready to do it at that very point. But as Connor was finally ready to start afresh, everything changed. I'm sorry, please watch your emergency. So the report was received at around 18 minutes past eight on Tuesday, the 19th of January. Uh, it was from a single female uh, walking her dog along the bank of the River Hell that runs adjacent to Thomas Clarkson Way. And I think I found a dead body. Pardon, sorry? Dead body. There's a dead body? Yeah. Can you tell if it's a male or a female? Uh, male, I think. Yeah. She initially thought that there had been some clothes that had been discarded at the water's edge, uh, but on getting closer, she'd realised that uh, there was a lifeless body of a young male that was at the water's edge. It looks like a teenager. Looks like a teenager. And you say you've actually touched him and there was no response, was there? I touched him and I touched him, yeah. And there's no chance that he's asleep or anything, there's no breathing or anything like that that you can see, is there? No. Emergency services immediately make their way to the scene. So we're heading towards the site where the body was found. He's lying slightly on his left side, uh, fully clothed, inclusive of baseball hat, gloves, um, trainers. The zip-up of the waterproof jacket was worn externally, uh, was, was tucked up underneath his chin. The head was slightly submerged under the water. It was high tide when officers attended, but the body wasn't completely submerged. Uh, it was at the water's side, um, but the head was under the water. No visible external injuries that would have suggested anything untoward. And at that moment in time, the death was unexplained. You need to keep an open mind at the early stages of that investigation in relation to what scenario has led to the death of this individual? And there are a number to consider. Initially, has this individual accidentally come to fall into the water? Had third party involvement been involved? Has somebody forcefully put him into that water? Or has this individual taken himself into that water purposely for a reason? With an unexplained death in front of them, police quickly secure the scene. It's real, real important on the discovery of a scene to preserve as much as we can so that any evidence that would be available to us at that location isn't disturbed in any way or rendered useless uh, as we move forward. There will be various cordons that will be put on, an inner cordon and an outer cordon in relation to keeping the area sterile. The access route for our staff in and out is the least likely route that is taken to enable the uh, scene to be preserved, evidentially, in relation to that. And obviously, the crime scene manager and the forensic officers will obviously ensure that they are appropriately addressed prior to entering the scene, prior to that body being recovered, so as to not contaminate anything that might be present. With the crime scene secured, the body is recovered, and finally, police can identify the individual before them. The crime scene manager was requested to scene 
they were able to take some fingerprints at the location for us to quickly identify uh, who he was to enable his family and those closest to him to be updated in relation to the unfortunate circumstances. There was an early identification that it was Connor Lyons. That's who this unfortunate individual was. When I arrived in the morning, I walked in, he usually has his bike in the hallway, but it wasn't there, but I didn't think that of it, you know. So I'd gone upstairs, gone in his room, wanted in his bed, so I didn't think now. I thought, oh, maybe he slept out. And then I'd gone to the neighbours because that morning she kept ringing me when I was, like, at my friend saying the dog was out um, and she's got it in her garden. So I said to her, well, would you be able to put it in your house, you know, until I get back? Kelly finds it odd that Connor's dog, Callie, is not with him, as they are always together. But when she arrives at her neighbour's home to collect the dog, the neighbour explains that it was found in an odd state. The dog was really muddy and wet, and she had to dry the dog off. It looked, it was acting a bit strange. It was just laid on a couch, you know, like looking quite sad. And the police turned up. So I thought, obviously, he's been Connor had been arrested for something, and they said, no, we need to talk to you in private. So that's when they took me in my garden and told me we found a body, you know, and we've checked his fingerprints, and it matches to Connor. I got a call of Connor's mum, Kelly, and she's screaming down the phone, and she said, that body on the riverbank is Connor. It's Connor. And he had just exploded. I was just praying it wasn't true. I was just thinking, no, this isn't true. Like, it's someone else. It's not Connor, you know, it can't be. And they were saying to me, can you come and identify his body? And I just didn't see real all the way there. I was just thinking, it's not going to be Connor, it's going to be someone else, you know. Please say it's not Connor, you know. And obviously, when I got there, it was. With no cause of death as yet confirmed, the family have to consider whether Connor has accidentally drowned, taken his own life, or has something more sinister happened. When I went into the morgue, um, Connor was behind a glass screen. It looked like he'd been beat up. He had, like, punch marks in his eyes. You could see marks around both sides of his neck and bruising around his nose and his eyes. Has he been in a fight? Has whoever's done this to him hurt him? I asked the police, is that where he'd been punched? And they said it could be from the water corrosion. So I didn't know what had happened, obviously, till he'd had his post-mortem. While the family awaits post-mortem results, police take an initial look into Connor's life to see if there might be anyone or anything that may have put him in harm's way. Connor was a, a very meek and mild individual, extremely well liked by his friends. He resided with his mother and siblings and formed a, an important part of their lives and that family set up. Um, he wasn't an individual that would engage in trouble or go looking for it. He had a criminal record, um, some minor offences in relation to a pedal cycle theft and some, some possession of cannabis. He's with the wrong crowd. They got him to do the, the stealing, and then once he's took the bike, because it was a push bike, they'd take it straight off him and ride off. So Connor's actually been seen taking it, not them. Connor basically was trying to, like, fit in, you know, so obviously he was, like, copying what these people was doing. But he never caused harm to anyone, you know, like, he never did anything to harm anyone. It was just stupid things, but he, he was always still, like, loving and caring. He'd never harm anyone. He wasn't somebody that was highlighted, uh, certainly not to Humberside Police, in relation to his background or offending history. He was just a well-liked individual that had moved to the area and never sought out any trouble. With no real clues in Connor's background and an unexpected death, police attempt to piece together the hours leading up to Connor's death. So there are a number of things that I need to consider. And obviously the most important thing is to, to look at who the interactions are that he's had. What is the direction of travel? Where has he been? 
prior to being found. The way that we go about that is quickly identifying the last sighting that we have of Connor leaving the home address and look at capturing him on CCTV or by independent witnesses and identifying the route of travel he may have taken. We do the same in relation to the deposition site of where he was found. We will work backwards and try and identify a route or individuals that he is with or if he has come out of there on his own in relation to, to, to heading towards where he was found. While police scour the local area for information, it isn't long before local media get involved. There were murmurings quite early on on social media and on other channels that there was something that had happened in the area, that there was a large emergency services presence. One of the first things that we'd have done as a newsroom is dispatch a reporter to the area with a response of the size that there was that day, because then we can have eyes on the ground. And from there, we start to build up a picture of what is happening and we make calls on what is the right information to report at certain times. As the hours tick by, police work with local media to glean any information into Connor's death. As a newspaper and a website, we do actively help uh, the police in investigations. It's something that we do quite regularly. We liaise with them to get the details of the appeal that they need to put out. It is something that we try to do and there, there are processes in place to make sure that, that happens in a controlled way that get, means the information reaches the right people and in the right ways. And as the police appeal is shared across social media, news of Connor's death reaches the wider community. Somebody had rang me on my phone and told me, have you heard what's, what's happened to Connor? And I went, no. And I couldn't believe it, I really couldn't believe it. I went on my phone, scrolling through Facebook, and there was just a no-end list of posts saying, God bless Connor, RIP, and that's really when it started to sink in. It wasn't a dream and it was really happening, and that's when it became more believable. It just hit, like, straight away, and I couldn't do nothing about it. It was horrible. But as the news spreads, speculation begins to circulate across social media. With Connor, there wasn't a cause of death. There were a lot of rumours regarding it because of the location where the body was found. You're on the edge of a river, the circumstances that it was found in overnight. I was hearing so much from everyone, like, I was hearing from social media, he's being stabbed, this has happened, that's happened, and we haven't got a clue. As a family, we don't, we don't have a clue. There's just a million things going through your mind. It, it's sickening, it is sickening. Everyone was just a bit confused, really, and, like, needed answers as to what had happened to Connor. When you're reporting on these sort of cases very early on, it's important to try and avoid speculation yourself. It's very easy to get caught in the trap of looking on social media and seeing the theories and start taking them as fact, and it is not something that we do as journalists. With no answer forthcoming, police take into consideration that Connor's dog was found wandering alone near to his home address that morning. It was clearly identified that Connor's dog, Callie, was the love of his life, for want of a better word. Um, they went everywhere together, always would be on a lead. So what led to Connor leaving his beloved Callie alone? A closer look at the scene begins to uncover further clues as to what may have happened to Connor. We did not ever recover the mobile phone that belonged to Connor Lyons, nor did we ever recover a gold Belcher bracelet that he had worn and hadn't taken off his wrist since receiving it as a Christmas present from his mum. That was valued at around £800 um, and never recovered. Um, and that was during the course of an extensive search it seen and additionally by the underwater search team at that location. And I think if it had been at the location, it would have been recovered and we would have found it. This evidence leads them to the theory that Connor may have been the victim of a robbery gone wrong. There was a whole host of social media activity in relation to this investigation. The chatter started with regards to sightings on social media of a quite specific mountain bike that belonged to Connor. It was a black Scott mountain bike that had some luminous yellow writing and specific markings on it, and everybody knew that that was Connor's bike. And quite quickly, there are then attempts to sell that pedal cycle on social media. But with Connor dead, 
Who is trying to sell his bike? Within days, police have a name. 22-year-old Cole Jarvis. So I said to the police, who is Cole Jarvis, do you know? Why, why are they saying he's got his bike? Just hours after being found dead in a river in the East Riding countryside, police have discovered someone has been trying to sell 17-year-old Connor Lyon's bike on social media. 22-year-old local man, Cole Jarvis. Cole Jarvis resides on the same estate as Connor Lyons. They'd probably been in a friendship and known each other for six to nine months since Connor had moved on to the Bransom estate. It appears Cole may have stolen Connor's pedal bike, but could he be in any way connected to Connor's unexplained death? Witnesses come forward to say that they had seen Cole on the bike the night before Connor was found dead. In the early hours of the 20th of January, an arrest was made of Cole Jarvis. That arrest was in relation to the theft of Connor's quite distinctive pedal cycle. Cole is brought into the police station for questioning. During that interview, Cole identified that he was really, really friendly with Connor and that he hadn't seen him or been in his company for at least two weeks prior to the point of his arrest. There were some questions asked about why he was in possession of the pedal cycle and an indication from Cole Jarvis that it had been sold in, in exchange for some cannabis. So he was quite happy to talk and made a poignant comment at the end of the interview that if he knew anything about what had happened or how Connor had come to be found deceased, uh, he wouldn't hesitate to contact the police and let us know. Could Cole be telling the truth? But while police continue to question him, post-mortem results come in. In the early stages, in terms of Connor's death, there was an appearance that he may have just, just drowned. And it was only once there was engagement um, by the uh, forensic sci scientists and also the pathologists in the case that there were aspects of the death which were not normal. So there were injuries to his neck which were consistent to his neck being compressed, strangled, whether by a ligature or somebody's arm. So in relation to the petechiae around the eyes uh, and the face and in the inside of the lips, those are small blood vessels that when oxygen is restricted uh, and the breathing is restricted, uh, it results in these blood vessels popping. Clearly identifies that at some stage um, there was an obstruction of that airway, likely by force. Ultimately, he did drown, but, but prior to that, he had suffered an assault which involved somebody compressing his neck. So, whilst alive at the time he drowned, it, it could have been that he was rendered unconscious. And that, taken together with the significant injury to the voice box, clearly identified third-party involvement. The results of the post-mortem immediately changed the course of the investigation. We were now looking at a murder inquiry, and I instructed that Cole Jarvis be arrested for murder at that point. With a murder investigation underway, the local community reacts to the shocking news. I thought they was close, to be honest, like those friends, but, and then when I heard about it, it just turned my head straight away with him. It was a shock to think that someone who would class each other's friends would do that to someone. In custody, Cole continues to tell police that the last time he saw Connor was two weeks ago. But would the CCTV from the night before Connor was found dead suggest otherwise? On the Brands Home Estate, we quite quickly pick up some CCTV footage of two individuals traveling together on foot. One of the individuals is seen with a dog on a leash, and police think this might be Connor with his dog, Callie. We then pick them up shortly after 8 o'clock on John Newton Way. That is near to an Asda supermarket, and the CCTV clearly picks both of those individuals up uh, together with the dog as they head through a cut-through. Cut-through heads in the general direction, 
uh, of Thomas Clarkson Way and the River Hell and directly towards where the deposition site was. The two individuals with the dog disappear from CCTV. But two hours later, one of them reappears. We had a witness that was travelling this road, Thomas Clarkson Way, heading home after uh, working for the evening. At around 40 minutes past 10 at the night, he sees a male figure coming from the opposite side of the road, from the, the, the area of the deposition site, really, of Connor's body. And also in company with him running loose is a silver, uh, goldy coloured silver retriever dog that we believe was actually the dog of Connor Lyons. That individual was wearing quite a distinctive green jacket. It was described as a parker without the fur. And that witness uh, kept that individual in sight as he walked in front of his vehicle before driving off home. That individual is then picked up less than a minute later from CCTV footage at the bottom of this lane, where he then heads back in towards the housing estate. Could this individual on CCTV be Cole Jarvis? And is he seen taking Connor's dog, Callie, after murdering him by the River Hull? Police obtain a warrant to search Cole's home address for evidence. They were the recovery of clothing from a home address, so the trainers with the distinctive flashes that were recovered that are captured on CCTV at various points from an individual making away from the deposition site were also caked in mud. Not only was Cole Jarvis's clothes wet and muddied, as might be consistent with, with somebody who was in the area where Connor Lyons was discovered, but also the soil samples in the area matched soil samples found on some of the clothing of, of Cole Jarvis. The distinctive coat that was worn, that was recovered. Again, mud samples from that, matching those from the deposition site, matching the descriptions of what witnesses tell us an individual was wearing, and also the CCTV footage in relation to it. So that was recovered also. And further digging leads police to a key item belonging to Connor. The pedal cycle that was offered for sale. That pedal cycle, during the course of our inquiries, was recovered from the guard, lock garden shed. But when forensics carry out tests, there really is a breakthrough. You had scientific evidence which looked at DNA findings. There was a, a piece of rope which was found at one of the places or addresses connected to Cole Jarvis. That rope, when submitted in relation to forensic examination, yielded DNA that was uh, able to be related to both Connor Lyons and Cole Jarvis. Might that have been the piece of rope that was used during the course of any incident that occurred between them? With the mountain of evidence stacked against him, Cole Jarvis is charged with the murder of Connor Lyons. At a hearing, Cole pleads not guilty to murder, which means a trial will ultimately take place. His defence was he was not responsible for causing injury and ultimately, therefore, causing death to, to, to Connor Lyons. While the CPS prepares a case for trial, Connor's family and friends have the agonising task of saying goodbye to their loved one. Connor's funeral, it was a really big turnout, a lot of people from the community turned up. There was hundreds and hundreds of people around the streets. The full of Hull, I can say, the full of Hull was behind Connor. Every, every single person, down from making banners, balloons, to the lads on the motorbikes, to the lads on the quads. People come out in, in the cars, beating the motorbikes, and the motorbikes stop the buses. So the convoys could all go to, to the church. Even the old house that they used to live in, where we grew up, they'd come out of that house and put banner up for Connor and everything. Honestly, it was like a bloody royal wedding or something. He had like a celebrity funeral. You know, random strangers didn't have to love Connor, but they did, because that's who Connor was. Everybody loved him. 
I've never ever seen a funeral like it in my, my days I've been alive. It's one I'll never ever forget till the day I die. It was absolutely beautiful. He got the most amazing send off. If only he knew. If only you could have seen that. Despite a beautiful send off for Connor, the upcoming trial continues to loom over his family. And with Connor's own friend accused of committing the most horrific crime against him, there's one question on everyone's lips. I want to know the truth. I want to actually know what happened to him. <laughs> 22-year-old Cole Jarvis has been charged with the murder of his friend, Connor Lyons. And a trial is set to begin in a matter of months. In many respects, for a complicated case, and this had its complications, it's quite a compressed timescale. So a lot of um, energy and resources have to go into them, making sure the case is ready um, by, by the time it's tried. Any good prosecutor will say that his or her role isn't just to get a conviction. It's to make sure, if there is a conviction, it's fair to make sure there's a proper outcome. So at every stage, every decision you make, you, you really have to look at it from both sides. And the key thing is keeping an open mind uh, throughout. Nine months after Connor's murder, the trial begins at Hull Crown Court, and his family recall seeing their loved one's alleged killer in the dock. I'd seen photos of Cole Jarvis, and I'd seen like stuff on Facebook, I'd seen videos, but I'd never seen Cole Jarvis myself, like, eye to eye. When we walked in and I first seen him, I, I felt physically sick and I felt like I could have killed him with my bare hands. Like, I've never felt anger. I was shaking from head to toe, I, sh I was shaking. Jarvis, when I looked up at him, he stood there, he had no remorse, he was shaking his neck from side to side, you know, like, clicking his neck. Um, just like staring at me and things like that, just no remorse whatsoever. The way he looks at you, his, his eyes are so cold. I've never seen anyone look so cold, ever. As the trial sets off, the court hears details about Cole's circle of friends that included Connor. Cole Jarvis's peer group and a circle of friends ranged from 14 years of age to about 17. So there was certainly a group that were a lot younger than him and probably a group of individuals he could hold influence over and perhaps lead. I couldn't understand that. I, cu I couldn't understand that. And I thought, did he do this, hang about with these young boys, to make him feel sort of he was in control, he was top dog? Didn't make sense. Witnesses described to the court how Connor initially looked up to Cole at the start of their friendship. But it wasn't long before things drastically changed. Connor had a motorbike. It was Connor's motorbike. Connor had paid for it. Cole Jarvis apparently fixed people's bikes. Connor's trusted Cole Jarvis to fix his motorbike, so he took the bike. And then when it's come to, can I have my bike back, please? It's no. He was supposed to be fixing this motorbike, and he wouldn't give it him back. So in the end, Connor's got really upset, and he thought well, I'll just have to go, you know, and try to stand up for myself and get it back. And when he's got to Cole Jarvis's house, Cole Jarvis has come outside and he's laughing at Connor, saying, you're not having it. There was one particular piece of footage which showed the two of them have a physical dispute, um, which involved the, 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 t the two of them, in, in essence, ramming their bikes against one another. One interpretation was that Cole Jarvis got the upper hand in that. Another is that it was evenly matched. That was something the jury had to, to consider. But the key thing was, it, it just showed friction between them. And then it was videoing Connor riding off, but then he struck Connor. He started grabbing him by the neck and things like that. And you could see in the video that Connor was a bit wary and scared of Jarvis. And their friendship soon deteriorated further. There was a pattern of bullying on behalf of Cole. There was cases of uh, harassment 
in terms of verbal harassment, communications, uh, physical assault. We used to get him in choke locks and knock his cap off his head and grab him around the neck all the time. You know, there was one time before when I was out fishing and he'd said to Connor, or oh, um, he'd grabbed him around the neck and said, do you want me to kill you now? Do you know, you're lucky I don't kill you now. Despite Cole's aggressive behaviour, the court hears how Connor did not always take the abuse lying down. Although he was treated in such a cruel way uh, by Cole, we know that he did stand up for himself using his words. He couldn't physically go and fight Cole, so he had to try and defend himself verbally as much as he could and try and make Cole think that, hang on a minute, I am going to stick up for myself, do you know, without having to. We saw communications between Cole and Connor that indicated that there was a, a level of two back and forth between the two. There was Connor answering back to Cole's abuse and the demands that Cole made. Jarvis didn't like the way that Connor could give as much verbally back. There'd been some text messages that got read out in court. Cole saying to Connor, watch what's going to happen, uh, keep, keep running your mouth and you watch where you end up and stuff like that. It could be something that led to Cole going further than he had ever before. The constant threat eventually took a toll on Connor. Cole Jarvis controlled Connor and he manipulated him. Like when you have a domestic violence with a man against a woman, this is what Cole Jarvis did to Connor. He manipulated him on a daily basis. He made him lose his confidence, his self-worth, his trust to not go out the house. He, he, he took everything away from Connor, he stripped him. Connor used to come home, like, angry all the time, shouting at me and things like that, and I didn't know, like, the reason why. And obviously it's because of what Jarvis was doing to him, but he didn't want to tell me. He was screaming out for help, like, for one of us to wake up. I wish that he had have opened up to us, the rest of his family, because we could have helped him, but we didn't know. The court hears how Connor took back control of his life by enrolling at college and working out a plan to get away from Brand's home. But in January 2021, Cole refused to let this happen. On Monday the 18th of January, probably at around 7 p.m., Connor leaves his home address. He leaves on his pedal cycle a distinctive Scott mountain cycle, and he also takes his dog, Callie, on a lead, as he always does. Connor meets Cole, and phone evidence suggests Connor was lured by his former friend to try to sort out their differences. I believe that on the night, Cole's kind of said to Connor, come on, mate, let's go for a walk and have a chat and whatever else, and we'll just sort it out. And I think Connor's being under the influence that I'm going to go and then I don't have to worry about this anymore. Tonight, let's get it squashed, and then I can concentrate on my college and all that. Connor and Cole are then seen on CCTV heading towards the River Hull. Connor, on the last bit of CCTV, you know that he's walking to his death with Cole Jarvis. And you know that's the last time anybody will ever see Connor, apart from Cole Jarvis, alive again. At some point after this moment, Cole attacks Connor. The evidence points to Connor having been strangled at some point during the evening. We don't know if this was with a ligature or with hands. It appears to have been done over clothing. Paul Jarvis has then, like, dragged Connor's body unconscious down to, like, to try and get him into the water. So at this point, he's took it upon himself to, like, you know, obviously, like, drown Connor. But I believe that Connor's dog, Callie, has tried to save Connor because Callie was absolutely wet through and covered in mud. Callie was soaking wet. She'd witnessed something. It was something horrendous. If only dogs could talk. After murdering Connor, Cole brings Callie back towards the Brands home estate and then steals Connor's bike. The following morning, Cole takes to social media to try to sell the bike. 
while also expressing his condolences over Connor's death. When it was seen about Connor that he'd been found on the riverbank and that Jarvis had actually commented on the photo of Connor on his push bite saying, R.I.P. Connor, which is disgusting. After a short but gruelling two-week trial at Hull Crown Court, the jury retires to deliberate a verdict. Such a big fear, thinking, right, when I walk in this room now, we're either going to get justice for Connor or we're not. That's it. It was hard because we had to stick up for Connor. So if, if it had got not guilt, we'd have failed him, you know? On the 6th of October, 2021, the jury returns its verdict. Cole Jarvis is found guilty of murder and is sentenced to 25 years in prison. The 25 years is a long time, but really, in my eyes, it should be a life for life. He should never get parole. He's going to be still young when he comes out. I still could go out there and live a life and have a family, whereas Connor can't, which is disgusting. Life should mean life. But even with Connor's killer behind bars, nothing will bring back the teenager who had his whole life ahead of him. It's impacted all our lives tremendously, and especially his mother, it, Kelly. It's changed Connor's mother, Kelly, beyond recognition. My life will never be the same again. I struggle every day. I can't sleep. I just, I don't like to go out in dark places. Everywhere I go, there's like, I, I can't go where like water is and my day-to-day -day things. I can't even go shopping. My anxiety, I've got really bad anxiety at the minute. Cole Jarvis not only took Connor, he took Kelly as well. This is what he's done. One year on, family and friends continue to keep Connor's memory alive at his grave. I try to come, like, most days. I come about two or three times a week to try and spend as much time as I can with Connor. I'm glad I picked this spot because it's really easy to find and I've been able to get his bench put next to his resting place. Me and Connor's dad have got him a headstone. It's going to be a black marble granite one, and it's going to have, like, a motorbike design on the top of it. And then once his headstone's here, it'll be all complete. It's a, a real big fitting tribute to him. It's just what he, he was, and it just shows how much we all love him and we miss him. <laughs>